this really does get into the, some of the nuts and bolts of disciple making because it gets into roles and what the relationship is going to look like. So Jesus, his primary role when he was with the disciples was as their teacher and as their Lord. But many people who interacted with Jesus only saw him as a teacher. Many of them only saw him as a healer. And so, you know, take that for an example. Some people, when they came to Jesus, the relationship that they wanted was sick person healer. And Jesus, I'm sick. What I want from you, what I want from this relationship is healing. And once the healing happened, that was the extent of the relationship. Jesus was willing to do that. He was willing to interact with people based on what they need and what they wanted from their relationship. And so even though he was willing to have different types of relationships with others, the primary goal of his ministry, those three years that he was walking the roads of Galilee and Judea, it was to train the 12. And so in the same way for us, I think we're, we're always trying to define the relationship because that's a big part of figuring out who are the people who are going to actually join us in this mission and that we're going to get the opportunity to disciple and who are those that we just need to bless and, and help based on where they're at and what they want from the relationship. Hey, Andrew, we're back. All right, great to be with you all this week. Back in our Thoroughly Equipped Studies working through the book of First Thessalonians. We've had just one week off kind of in between going through uh, each of the chapters. Andrew, this is actually one of our favorite things that we get to do um, with each other, but also with the listeners of uh, our End of the Harvest community. So we're excited to be with you today to talk about Paul, this church in Thessalonica, and just things that God's teaching us out of the scriptures. So Andrew, it's been a week or two. Can you just catch us up? It's like, why is, why is Bible study important? The uniqueness of First Thessalonians kind of catch us up a little bit. We want to do these in-depth studies of different books of the Bible, maybe once or twice uh, a year. It's a big part of our own lives. We're doing it throughout the years, but we want to have these conversations that we put out on the YouTube channel and uh, over on the podcast just to give folks an opportunity to learn with us as we go through a book of the Bible. So we've been working through First Thessalonians. Uh, prior to that, earlier this year, we did a, a series through the book of Titus. Folks can check that out. I think it's so important. We've talked about revelation and how in the Christian faith, it's about transformation, that, that the Lord comes into our lives and begins to reshape us and really restore us to what he always intended for humanity. But that transformation is a response to something that God has already done, which we learn about in the scriptures through the revelation of God. And so transformation follows revelation. That's why Bible study is so important is because we're, we're turning our focus onto what God has revealed about himself, what he's revealed about his purpose for our lives, the future. We're going to see that here in the final two chapters of Thessalonians. So um, Bible study is crucial. We're not going to experience the transformation that God has for us if we don't learn how to live in his revelation, which is um, one of the main ways he's revealed himself is through the scripture. So that's why Bible study is so important to us. John, we're doing this study on 1 Thessalonians. Um, we, we've been going through it. This is episode four of this series. Why don't you give us a quick recap of what we learned in chapters one through three before we dive into chapter four? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I, I love how you're connecting revelation and then application and transformation because it's impossible to do something that you don't know, you know, so, and, and really being able to press in the scriptures helps us really make a deeper connection between those things rather than just, you're jumping through the hoops and, um, someone just said something that maybe was stuck out or was sticky at, at a chapel message or at church service, but it said, no, I actually spent time with Jesus and he gave me this thing. And I know exactly what he wants me to do because I spent time with him. Mm -hmm. So I love that. I think that's so important. Well, we've really kind of been talking about, um, Paul kind of defining the relationship kind of all the way through these first couple of chapters. Hey, remember when we were with you, um, the instructions that we gave you, how we lived our lives, the example we were to you. Um, so that's really those first couple of chapters. He has some prayers that he's praying for them, wanting them to grow, um, <clears throat> like, and how they live, how much that really matters and how he connects that to how they lived in their presence mm -hmm. and just how important the disciples were to Paul and Silas and Timothy, how much they really 
really love them. And you just get such a cool glimpse of that here that, you know, they couldn't even stand to be apart from them. They wanted to know how they're doing because they cared and loved about them so much. And there's just so many implications for us, Andrew, as we're discipling people and the love and concern that comes with helping them grow. So it's been full. We'd really encourage you to go back. Um, maybe we'll just kind of tag that up in the, in the corner here so you can go back uh, to episode one and just kind of check that out of what we've kind of walked through. But um, there's a couple key words that I wanted just to, to kind of talk to you about, Andrew, that helped me remember the book so far. And this is actually all the way through the book. But um, Paul is using these words like always, in all circumstances, in every form. He says completely, constantly, everywhere, without <laughs> ceasing. He says night and day. <laughs> and then he says more and more a couple times. He actually does that in this chapter that we're in right now. And just how much he wants them to continue to grow and mature and walk with Jesus and enjoy him and, and love and support each other um, and to honor the, those who don't yet know Jesus. Um, that's kind of this tone and flavor of, of this book so far. That, so it's been a lot of fun to kind of walk through it with you. Yeah, we d discussed that this is one of the oldest books in our New Testament. And it really gives us insight into Paul's mindset and his method of making disciples. So it's a it's a beautiful book where we get to sort of pull back the curtain and see what was Paul trying to accomplish as he traveled around the Roman world, preaching this message about Jesus and making disciples. What was he trying to do? How was he going about doing it? And like you said, this, uh, these first three chapters, because Paul didn't get as much time with the Thessalonians as he wanted, we see in these first three chapters that he's just, like you said, defining the relationship. He's, he's reminding them of how things went, who they were, Paul and his team, and who the believers are now that they belong to Christ. Um, now, as we, as we kind of shift into this week, we're going to be talking about um, chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. We're not going to do the whole chapter. We'll finish that next week on next week's episode. Um, he really begins to turn to discuss, okay, now that we have reset the relationship, let's talk about what it looks like to live for Jesus. And so we'll focus on that here in chapters 4 and 5. But uh, we had a question by uh, Christian on our YouTube channel. So do you want to read that for us, John? It might be a good way just to introduce this week's conversation from chapter four. Yeah, absolutely. So Christian asked this. Uh, this is his statement from YouTube. He says, I, I had a question about DTR. If you don't know what DTR is, that means define the relationship. Um, and he says that he, he says, I completely agree with you that Paul is doing that to encourage their faith. So my question is, what is the best timing for this in individual relationships when you're trying to help someone grow? Um, and then he asks, he goes on, he says, also, do you think it is necessary to always DTR? And so he says, I've had struggles with this in the past. So there's a couple questions in there, Andrew. But um, yeah, so what do you think about defining the relationship? When's the timing best? And how does it, and is it always appropriate? Defining the relationship as, as we were describing it, I don't know if it was a chapter three or chapter two, but we've been talking about the importance of that and how Paul was doing that in those first three chapters. But it really goes to helping clarify uh, as an older believer, the role that you want to play in the lives of, of those that you're ministering to. And it's also, it's a, it's a conversation, like you're listening to hear back from them. Do they want you in that role? Do they want to learn from you? Do they want to be mentored by you? Uh, do they want to learn from you in a more direct way where you're teaching them and instructing them and modeling for them? Or do they want to learn from you um, in an oblique way where they see you as an older, more mature believer, they appreciate your example, but they don't necessarily want to spend more time with you learning and being taught by you. Jesus did this, I think. I think it's, I do think it's always necessary, not just in discipling relationships, but really with any relationship. You and I were talking about this, whether it's romantic or friendship, even work, work relationships you're feeling out with the people around you, what does this relationship need to look like? What are they hoping from it? What are, what are you wanting to offer? And is there a good connection there? Is there a good fit? So when Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I mean, that's, yeah. 
him defining the relationship. He's basically saying that he's not happy <laughs> with the, the relationship that was going on at that time between him and the crowds because he was Lord, he is Lord, but they, their lives and the way that they were acting toward him, even though they were using that word, demonstrated that they, they didn't really have that kind of relationship with him. And, and Jesus wanted that kind of relationship. So I think it's always necessary. Uh, I think sometimes we can go about that in a, a more natural way. Sometimes it has to be more explicit. Um, here, Paul is writing a letter to the believers. And like we discussed before, he didn't have as much time with them in person that he had wanted to. And so he's being very explicit and careful to make sure that he reframes the relationship so that they understand who he is, how he's wanting to help them in their faith, um, and how he sees them. So all of those analogies about you know treating them as a father, a as a mother, you see all of that is, is part of how Paul is trying to help them understand what he has to offer them and, and how he wants to help them. How have you seen this in your own life and ministry, John? And what would you say is, is it always necessary? And when should you go about trying to define the relationship? I think this is a great question by Christian, um, Andrew. And I just, as I think about this principle, um, this is kind of a funny story, but um, some friends of ours, we were reading through a book together and uh, we ended up like framing up this little quote from the book as we we're studying through this together. And the, the quote is something like clearly defined expectations is life's easiest way to avoid disappointment. <laughs> and so uh, no lie, this is like hanging up in the house still, you know, <laughs> so there's a couple that are friends of ours. And we were actually just talking about this last night, um, mm -hmm. that this principle. So Franco's question, Christian's uh, question is very good here because it, what it helps us do is thinking through, well, did Jesus do it? Like you said, how does it work in life? Um, and you know, I don't want to read too far between the lines, but, uh, when he says I've had struggles with this in the past, sometimes when you offer to train someone and, and help them become a disciple maker, um, it doesn't go well because they're not interested. Um, but that's actually very, ultimately very clarifying and very healthy. Um, though it's also at the same time, very disappointing, you know, so as we're trying to be like Jesus mm -hmm. and make disciples who make disciples, um, when we define the relationship, what, what we're saying is we would like to offer you training. Um, and what you might get back from them is like, well, Hey, that's cool. But you know, I just rather just come to Bible study or, or maybe we could have accountability or have coffee every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Um, so where I think this is important um, and where this line becomes is when you begin to see someone have a heart for the scriptures and they're in the scriptures and you're being able to get consistent time with them and they've been faithful to a, kind of attend Bible study or church with you and you're spending time with them and you've been able to help them, but you see something much more for them and what they can be, right? And that God wants to help them become a disciple maker. Well, this is when you're making that transition from helping to training. And I think that's when defining the relationship is really important. And it's really okay. The context in which Jesus trained the disciples was in helping everybody that kind of passed their way that the Lord, sent, that the Father sent them. Um, so it's okay if you have people that are around that just want help as you search for people that you're looking to train to become disciple makers. And so just as it's not gone well, or if you've had struggles with it in the past, Christian, we just want to encourage you. Um, so have Andrew and I. <laughs> and so as every disciple maker <laughs> that's walked the face of the earth, they've had struggles with, hey, I would really love for you to join me in making disciples and learning how to make disciples who make disciples and repeat the process over and over again. And they just say, well, I'd rather just read my Bible. Unfortunately, people even say, well, I'm not even interested in that anymore. Um, so, hey, thanks for the offer. And they kind of move on. So I, I do think defining the relationship is so important, particularly if we're after making disciples who make disciples. And in this context in First Thessalonians, Andrew, we were talking about this before we jumped on. It's, it stands as the setting for some truths that he's going to send over the next couple chapters. So almost... This whole couple, three chapters here, he's just setting up, hey, I need to give you some truths that you really need to live by. Mm. But if you don't remember, I was like a mom. If you don't remember, I was like a father. If you don't know that you became so dear to us, we gave our very own lives. It's real hard to kind of receive some of those truths as they come across. And so that just some couple quick thoughts as I think about Christian's uh, question. 
Yeah, great, great question, Christian. This really does get into the, some of the nuts and bolts of disciple making, which again, we're seeing it with Paul in his interaction with the, uh, the Thessalonians. Um, it's, the, it's true for us, Jesus. It was true for Jesus. You know, there were some people who, because it gets into roles and what the relationship is going to look like. So Jesus, his primary role when he was with the disciples was as their teacher and as their Lord. But many people who interacted with Jesus only saw him as a teacher. Many of them only saw him as a healer. And so, you know, take that for an example. Some people, when they came to Jesus, the relationship that they wanted was sick person healer. And Jesus, I, I'm sick. What I want from you, what I want from this relationship is healing. And once the healing happened, as far as we know, that was the extent of the relationship. Jesus was willing to do that. He was willing to interact with people based on what they needed and what they wanted from the relationship. Ultimately, he had a mission that he had been sent to earth by the Father to accomplish. Part of that, a big part of that was to train the 12. And so even though he was willing to have different types of relationships with others, the, uh, the primary goal of his ministry those three years that he was walking the uh, the roads of, of Galilee and Judea were to, tr it was to train the 12. And so in the same way for us, I think we're, we're always trying to define the relationship because that's a big part of figuring out who are the people who are going to actually join us in this mission and that we're going to get the opportunity to disciple and who are those that we just need to bless and, and help based on where they're at and what they want from, from the relationship. So maybe maybe we should shift in um, to chapter four here, so we don't we don't um, cut ourselves short on time to discuss chapter twelve, uh, chapter four, verses one through twelve. Um, I really see him, like I said, making a, a turn here. He's he spent the first three chapters, you know, reviewing the relationship that they've had and bringing them up to the present. And now in verse one, my Bible actually says, as for other matters, brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. I think um, different English versions will read it differently, but you can kind of see there that he's, he's kind of turning the corner. And what do you see here in uh, chapter four, these first 12 verses, John? Yeah, he says, finally, in, in the ESV, <laughs> you know, finally, like, all right, I finally get to talk about <laughs> what I need to talk about almost, you know. Um, you want to read it for us? Uh, we'll, we'll actually put this text up for you if you're watching on YouTube. Um, you want to just read 1 through 12? We got the time to do it, you think, Andrew? Yeah, you want me to just read through it? Yeah, I want you to read through it, and we'll put your uh, text map up. So if folks want to see how Andrew text maps um, through 1 Thessalonians 4, you'll be able to see it. So go ahead, Andrew. All right, so this says, As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you, how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans, who do not know God. And in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins, as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. There's some good stuff in here. Um, anytime you're in the Bible, there's always something good. But I, I, yeah, it's interesting that I don't know how you connect it on your map, Andrew. Um, but for me, um, I connected what you received from us with instructions. So what did the Thessalonians actually get from Paul, Silas, and Timothy? They got instructions. What were those instructions about? 
those instructions are about how to walk and how to please God. Hmm. Okay. So what do I do? Oh, I should be sanctified. And then the rest of it is he's basically saying, this is what that actually looks like to be set sanctified or set apart. This is what it looks like to be holy and set apart. So, you know, what did they receive? They received instructions. What were those instructions about how to walk and how to please God? How do you do that? You'd be sanctified. What's it actually look like to be sanctified? Hmm. So these are kind of like these just tears of, Hey, I'm getting more and more clarity on what I'm supposed to do as a disciple of Jesus as I walk with him. And then that's where he gets very specific, abstains from sexual immorality, control your body, be holy, don't be like the Gentiles, love your brothers and excel still more. And then and be careful with those, how you interact with those around you. And I, I realize I just went through the entire 12 verses there, but I, I like how um, you'll see this with Paul a lot, where he's kind of stepping you in with greater clarity on what he really wants to talk about. And so that, that really stuck out to me as he, as he, as he kind of says, well, finally brothers, you know, and now let's get to the meat of the matter, basically hmm. as he transfers with, with verse one. Exactly. You see, he, he's been talking in previous chapters about his motivations and his heart for them. But here in the first two verses, we get insights into, well, when he was with them, what was happening? And he says that we instructed you how to live. So, I love that. I'm, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, yep. that's, that's really what disciple making is all about. You're, you're giving instruction, but it's, it's, it's a type of instruction. It's an, it's an instruction that is designed to help new believers, young believers know how to live. So it's not just what to believe, but how to live. And this is crucial because how we live pleases God or fails to please God. And so yep. Here we see, it goes back to Jesus, you know, teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And that's, that's what Paul was doing with the Thessalonians, whether he was able to be there as long as he wanted to or not. While he was there, he was actively instructing them how to live in order to please God. And I think that also shows me the, the critical nature of generational disciple making, older believers passing on the faith to a new generation because we don't just naturally know how to live as followers of Jesus. Um, when Jesus said, make disciples, he talked about baptizing them, teaching them. So, you know, there's a book that um, is pretty well known in the circles that, that we came out of John called disciples are made, not born. And I think you see that dynamic here in, in Thessalonians that if we're going to live in a way that pleases God, it's going to be because older generations have instructed us how to do that. It's not going to be because we just figure it all out on our own or we naturally understand how to live in a way that pleases God. So that's um, one of the big thoughts that stood out to me here in this chapter is, is just the, the clarity that this this work of making disciples is crucial because we want a world full of people who are living in ways that please God. That's not going to happen if older believers are not committed to giving instruction, to to explicitly teaching. This is this is how you should be living. Yeah, it's so good. And Andrew, like what sticks out to me even more is that he says, do so more and more. So it's not even as if he instructed them. He, he instructed them. But then he also was like, hey, we lived among you for your sake. That as well. But then he's also coming back to say, hey, remember, like, and hey, you're already doing that thing. Sweet. But do it more and more. Right. And I was hoping there was like a real nugget there. I was like looking the word up. I was like, oh, there's got to be something good. You know, <laughs> it's this word Malin, uh, Greek 3123. It really just it means to do something to a greater degree. But one of the sub definitions was be more willing and more readily willing to do it. So you're actually looking for opportunities to excel still more. You're, it's actually more natural and it becomes more clear. And you can't, it's almost like you can't wait to do, to be more set apart, to be more holy, hmm. um, to have more self-control. It, it's a very interesting kind of feel to that word. Hmm. Um, so not only did he just give instruction, not only did he show those instructions in practical ways, but then he's also reminding them, hey, if you are doing those things, you have to continue in them over and over and over again. So how about those couple things? It, it did seem like there were two clear breakdowns, right? Yeah. Of like 
how to live a certain way, live a like live a holy life and then lead a quiet life. So hmm. I'd love to, what about the specific things there? He actually talks about sexual immorality. He talks about controlling our own body, self-control. And mm-hmm. um, he talks about um, doing that in holiness, not being like the Gentiles. And he talks about how we actually interact with each other, believers and non-believers. So how about those specific things you think, Andrew? As I was reading and reflecting on this specific passage, those were two phrases that I highlighted. And we've talked about this, that I will use the yellow highlighter very sparingly when I go through a text and, and do the text mapping. John, we will put a link so folks can, um, if they want just to look at uh, my study specifically on how I, I mapped out this text. But... You know, he, he talks about, hey, we're giving you instruction. We have been giving you instruction on how to live so that you please God. And then, of course, he's going to do that through the rest of the chapter. So he's he's picking up where he left off when he was with them in person. He was talking about how to live in a way that pleases God. And now he's going to expound on that here in chapters four and five. And there really are these two uh, initial subjects that he addresses. So one is uh, living a holy life. So I highlighted that live a holy life. Just that phrase. This is one of the ways that you're going to live in a, to please God is if you live a holy life and specifically in this area of sexual immorality, uh, sexual holiness. And the second is to lead a quiet life. So I highlighted that in verse 11. And there he's talking about loving others, but specifically by working diligently with your own hands so that you will not be a burden, but you'll be in a position to actually help others to be uh, outward focused versus, um, you know, we, we sometimes talk about, you know, givers and takers. And mm-hmm. one of the simple ways to think about loving others is to give more than you take. Now, all of us have needs, like that's why we have the church. We have, you know, God gives us, uh, um, significant others in our lives, whether it's friends or spouses. So God's design is that we would be interdependent with others. But if you get a community of people who are all trying to give more than they take, that's going to be a beautiful community. Uh, Mm -hmm. That's going to be a community that pleases God. And so he's talking about loving others by learning how to lead a quiet life. I also love that phrase in my Bible. In verse 11, it says, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. And we often talk about how the kingdom is upside down. It's countercultural. But if you think about having an ambition in life for most of us in modern, in the modern world to, to be ambitious is probably to make a lot of noise. It's, it's to be successful. It's to become well-known. It's to become wealthy. Um, You know, our very definition of success is not to lead a quiet life, <laughs> to work with our own sure hands. I mean, that almost seems yeah. like you're not ambitious. If you're just trying to lead a quiet life and work with your hands and not be in need. Um, <clears throat> but again, that's one of the reasons why we said Bible study is so important because what our culture is telling us success looks like and what, what we should be ambitious for and what God is showing us success looks like and what we should be, be ambitious for are two are two totally different things. So he does address these two areas, live a holy life, lead a quiet life. If you can pursue those things and grow more and more, you're going to be living the lifestyle of a disciple, someone whose life pleases God. Yeah, Andrew, the, <laughs> I, I, I can't help but laugh a little bit because there's this great mix of don'ts and do's. And, and there's just... For me growing up, and this was no fault of anybody around me, I maybe I just only heard the don'ts, you know. I'm sure they were telling me the do's, you know. But I, I, you know, these are the things you ought to engage in as a believer and as a follower of Jesus. So it's almost if one just directly feeds into the other. If I'm working on my sexual immorality and being sanctified and set apart and I'm controlling my own body and it's not just in pure passions like the Gentiles, it actually ends up being quite easy to do the second part, which is to be to love my brother as well. Um, and not just in like a in a give and take way, but to give myself away freely in agape love. And this is the two words there. We might talk about that in a little bit. But then also my paradigm of the kingdom is totally different because one of the things he talks about is, you know, don't the Lord is the avenger. So if I have that in my mind, I know I can trust God for justice. I don't have to, to get my own justice. So all of those things kind of stuck out um, as I as I read through that. It wasn't just don't, 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 don't. 
actually wasn't just engage, 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 do these things. It was actually a great mixture of both of those things. And the, and when he lived his life out in front of him, they saw how that, how that kind of played off of each other. Don't do this, do, do this. And I love in Bible study that one of the things the Bible is so helpful with is that if, you, if you'll pay attention to what's compared and contrasted, mm. it's clued into what, what right looks like. Not like this, but instead like this. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of these in, in this um, text. One of my key cross-references was Romans 6.13. And I'll, I'll slide over there and just read it because I feel like he captures this idea of living with self-control, um, not giving yourselves to sexual morality, being sanctified, set apart. Mm-hmm. This is uh, Paul again addressing the, the Romans. He says, um, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life Hmm. and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Um, For sin will have no dominion over you because you're not under law, but you're under grace because you've been changed because Jesus is in your life. You now present yourself and your, your goals, your ambitions, what you're leading and giving yourself to is completely, totally different. Um, You're presenting yourselves very purposefully to God for his purposes, not to your lusts and your passions. Um, but instead, instead to God. So that was just one of the cross references I felt like gave some real clarity. I, I'm actually presenting myself. I'm very purposeful, which brings us back to that more willingly and more readily. That word more and more, right? Right. So, what you're highlighting there is there's a connection between these two chunks, right? So the yes. you know the, the first paragraph there is about um, sexual immorality and how we should be living holy lives. We should learn to control our own body. The second section is about loving each other and growing in in that. And these aren't just two random concepts thrown, you know, back to back, but there's actually a connection between them. Um, you know, the, the cross reference that stood out to me was uh, Luke 9, 23, where he says, anyone who would come after me, let him deny himself take up his cross daily and follow me. And that's the the dynamic that I see here is that, so the first part is to, mine says, each of you should learn to control your own body. And that really touches on learning to deny ourselves. We have these natural impulses. In fact, he goes on and says that the pagans are driven by passionate lust. So they're not controlling themselves. They're just going with these natural lusts that all of us have. But part of discipleship is learning to control our own bodies, learning to deny ourselves. We can't get away from that. Jesus told us from the very beginning, if we're going to follow him, it will involve denying ourselves. But it isn't just deny yourself into a vacuum. <laughs> you know, what's <laughs> supposed to come into there after denying yourself is take up your cross and follow me. And I think Paul really is touching on that with loving each other, learning how to, to give yourself to a quiet life, working with your hands um, so that you're in a position to, to bear the burdens of others. And he really builds on that. We'll, ta- we'll see that next week as he really gets into the expectations that every believer is supposed to be building up other believers. There's a work that God has for us to do. And um, this chapter four is really talking about the, the foundational work that needs to happen in our own lives if we're going to be the kind of people that can, can do the work that he's going to talk about in, uh, in chapter five. So a question I did have, John, and we, we're kind of touching on it here is, do you think that these were issues that the Thessalonians were especially dealing with. And that's why Paul goes straight into self-control and sexual immorality and and holiness, and then moves to lead a quiet life, uh, make it, make it your ambition to work with your hands. Or do you think this is more general, like any believer, these are going to be two issues that you probably want to address early on in your disciple making? No, no, no big deal. Just put me on the spot here. So I was going <laughs> Asking you the hard hitting questions. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you just think about this, I wish it was an isolated incident, like, but he's addressing sexual morality and how we treat each other in every single letter that he writes 
period ever. Right. Um, so, so my guess is yes. You know, like, right. Yes, it was a it was a thing specifically happening in Thessalonica. Right. But it's also one of the things that ought to be true as we come into the kingdom that's changed about us. Hmm. The way we live our lives matters. It's we are changed people because of Jesus. And so he's having to address them because it's our normal everyday struggle with our flesh. Um, in fact, he actually talks about the Holy Spirit, which I think is clues us into this, mm -hmm. you know, but then it's also a very normal part of um, it's individual to them, but it's also a very normal part of, of life in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a yes, yes kind of answer on this is that it was probably their unique challenge. Um, and that's why I think the flesh and the spirit, it, he doesn't necessarily address that concept, but he says, hey, if you're disregarding this idea of holiness, you're disregarding God. And and by the way, God's mm. given you a Holy Spirit to help you see this idea of holiness, that you're set apart, that you're sealed mm -hmm. um, as his people because of the Holy Spirit. So um, it's, we've talked about this idea that the scriptures aren't written to us, but they're written for us. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of the way, ways where it almost is this one for one transfer. As you read about what he's addressing with them, it's exactly what's happening in Christendom today. The exact same problems that we're having to address as God's people mm -hmm. and that we are addressing as individuals who are seeking to follow God and honor him with all that we are and all that we say and do. Yeah. Um, so this idea of walking properly, pleasing God. Um, yeah. Well, how to walk and please God. That's these, these ideas are going to be wrapped up for any believer. So he's talking specifically about sexual immorality here. But I think if we take it back to first principles, what he's really talking about is what drives your life. And mm. for the pagans, which includes us before Christ, what drives our life is passionate lust. We have these desires. It is kind of fascinating that our, I, I do believe that this was a specific issue that needed to be addressed with these believers. Agree. But like yep. you said, it's also generally true of humanity. And and how true is it today where this is at the heart of some of our, our most contentious cultural questions is, are we defined by our desires? And the world is saying explicitly, yes, I was born with this desire. That is what defines who I am. And therefore, I'm living in alignment with this desire, with this passion and with this passion. And, mm. and Paul says, of course, that's how the world is going to live. Uh, something is going to determine your lifestyle, your sense of identity. And, but what he's saying is that for those of us who belong to Christ, it should no longer be just our natural passions and desires. Those should not be what define how we see ourselves or how we go about pursuing the good life. He says we should learn to control our own bodies in a way that is holy and honorable, that there's there's a way of managing this life that God has given me in the body of, of harnessing it and then directing it to live in a way that isn't just necessarily in alignment with my my passions and my desires. It's it's lived in a way that I know is gonna please God. It's gonna it's gonna live set apart holy. It's gonna live uh, honorable in, in a way that is honorable in his sight. And again, it goes back to, for me, Luke 9, 23, from the very beginning, this is, yep. this is a core decision that we have to make is, am I willing to deny myself? If I want to come after Jesus, if I want to follow him, am I willing to learn to control our own bodies? I also love, I'd love to hear how it reads in the ESV in verse four here. He says, each of you should learn to control your own body. I love the idea there that this, again, is not something that's just going to be a switch that you turn. Oh, I came to faith and right. now I, I'm, I'm controlling my body perfectly. Um, this is something that we're going to be learning really over the course of our lives. I've definitely seen this in my own life. And if we just keep it with this topic of sexual immorality, um, there are challenges with the, the area of purity that I've had to learn over time 
how to control my own body so that I'm living in a way that is holy and honorable. And I don't, I don't do it perfectly now, but I can definitely see the trend line that I have been learning. Hey, there's certain things that are triggers there. And we talked about this with Steve McGee. Maybe we can put yep. a, a link here if folks want to uh, go back to learning how, what are those triggers? What are, what are ways that get you off track to, to living in a holy and honorable way? It, it's something that we have to learn. I would also say, um, I know I, I, I'm talking a little bit too long here, but even though this is specifically talking about sexual immorality, the first principle is learning to control your own body so that you don't just live by your passions. And that is a much broader challenge than just sex or sexuality. You know, that gets into how we spend our time. So many of us struggle with um, not being present, just being addicted to uh, sensationalism, whether that's scrolling social media and getting, we're in an election season. So, so many of us are just completely consumed with what is happening in the world around us that we're really being driven by these passions. Uh, our lives are being directed by these passionate lusts, these strong desires, instead of being directed by God's spirit and learning to control ourselves. So it's, it's true for sexual immorality, but it's a broader principle of what's going to determine how I go about my my daily life. That's the last thing I would say here, John. Um, I'm filibustering right now. But in <laughs> verse 12, he finishes by saying, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. And that's really what's at stake here is my daily life, not just what I believe, not just am I going out to a, a weekly church service or a weekly gathering of believers, but is my daily life being you know, determined and directed by God? That's what Paul is talking about here. I'm glad that you mentioned the Luke 9, 23, because I do think it's this very clear, I have to say no in order to say yes. Yes. You know, and it's actually that text says, then he said to them all, whoever is around, whoever's in earshot, just match my microphone here. Whoever's in earshot, he, he says, if anyone would come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. Say no in order to say yes. Hmm. Um, and, and the fact that you mentioned uh, Steve as well. But one of the th points that Steve makes is I actually had to engage God so God could tell me who I am and what I struggle with hmm. so I could then begin learning how to control myself. <laughs> so this, this journey of, so the ESV says that each one of you know how to control his own body, each know how to. So mm -hmm. this, like you're saying, it's this learning process. And so Steve actually just pull, peels all that back for us in his, in his um, YouTube, his episode where we just talk about, I had to ask God who I was and why did I struggle with him? And, and he had to reveal that to me so that I could even know what my triggers are and those things. But I, I looked up that word as I want to know what's it look like to control your body. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, people talk about having like an out of body experience. I've never right. had one of these. I, I don't know if you've had, um, well, it's like this out of body experience. Like it just kind of happened or, um, we like Brian Regan. He's a funny comedian. He talks about how he like, he said something. He's like, no, 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 I don't want to say it. And he like tries to grab his <laughs> words out, you know, um, or fisherman. Uh, so like every once in a while I, I was, I would go fish with my dad and uh, I caught, I hooked a big catfish and that catfish was running me up and down the creek. I'm supposed to say creek, but it's, it's it's in there deep. It's running me up and down. And he was fishing a little bit farther down downstream from me. And my line gets onto his line. Hmm. And uh, he could just see his pole going into the water. He's like, oh, no, he's helping me net this big catfish. And his pole's going off into the water. I promise this will come back. Just, just stay with me in the story. And so I finally get my catfish in. He's like, oh, man, that was my dad's fishing pole. You know, like we'd have this pole probably, it's probably 50 years old, you know. Hmm. And as I'm like pulling the fish up and I'm unhooking it. I was like, Oh, Hey, there's two lines in here. So I'm like pulling this line and here comes my dad's pole, you know? <laughs> but if you've ever had that moment where the pole is like going off of, of whatever rock you're holding it on or goes off the side of the boat, you're trying to grab that pole. Mm -hmm. You're trying to grab and get control of that fishing pole or like one of these out of body experiences or like you said something, you're trying to grab it back. Like, Oh, I wish I didn't say that. That's this picture of control your body. Um, he like own your body. He's saying, Hey, get your body, like possess it. Hmm. 
Um, mm. almost as if it's out there. Like if, if mm. you don't do something with it, it's going to do it. It's going to run itself. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? It's like yeah. an, some sort of like automatic machine. Like if you don't put any like ones and zeros into a computer or like a scary thing about AI is that it, it might be running our world. And we won't have any say over it here shortly. You know, um, you have to own it. You have to grab it. So I, I think really what he's saying is, is that if you don't possess this thing, it will possess you. Mm. It mm. will own you. Um, Judges verse 10 talks about that. Like unreasoning animals, they do by instinct the things that will kill them. Mm. Um, did I say judges? I meant to say Jude, mm. Jude 10. Mm. Um, so if I just kind of let it go on autopilot, if I don't grab it, if I don't possess it, if it's not in my, and if I'm not in charge of it, it will be in charge of me. That's the default setting mm. on our bodies. Um, and then I have to know how to do that. I have to grow in it. Right. So I'm like studying myself and understanding, like you said, what are the triggers? What gets me mad? So sometimes I have to say, why am I grouchy right now? <laughs> Um, oh, it's because of this thing. Well, why am I treating that person poorly? Because of something that God's trying to teach me. Um, so the, I know that's a, a lot there in that passage, a lot kind of as we're talking about owning your body. But I think that's a big one. Um, and Steve kind of gives us some clue ins. We'll, we'll link his episode. But boy, I just thought that was so full. Um, we're just going to we're going to naturally lose control of our bodies and we're going to let it lead us and guide us. And that's scary. Hmm. Um so anyway, yeah, long answer to a long statement. Yeah. And a, and a long story. So there you go. <laughs> I like it though. And one thought that crossed my mind, which I hadn't really thought of it this way, but as you were sharing that, sometimes folks will talk about, well, Christianity is just a way to to live life. Or they'll talk about uh, an alternative lifestyle. Well, I'm, I'm living out of step with most of society, but it's just an alternate alternative lifestyle. But what you're really describing is that the Lord is really trying to bring us into harmony with a whole new way of living that whether regardless of how you're living as a pagan, our, our lives before Jesus, um, we weren't really in control of those lives. You know, we were being driven by these passions. Like you said, our, our bodies are basically directing us versus the other way around and only as, as Christ comes to live in us and he begins to teach us how to, to learn to control ourselves and to live in a way that is holy and honorable, does he give us the opportunity to, you know, he kind of, it's like the reins of a horse, you know, you, you, only then do you actually get a chance to hold those reins and begin to live on purpose versus just following the passions that, that are coming from within or from the culture around you. Um, so it is really a, a different way of understanding what it means to, to live the good life. We're going to expand yeah, on and, this in Andrew, this, this is the, um, this is the created in God's image. Mm. This is, this is root. This idea is rooted in, we were created in the image of God. No other creation has the ability to not just react to external stimulus. Mm. If I leave food out for my dog, she will eat <laughs> and eat and eat until she dies. Mm. Um, if you see an animal that's in heat with another animal that's looking for an animal in heat, there's no self-control involved. <laughs> it just happens. Yeah. Um, so th that's why I think it's so important for us to highlight this here. Like we, we have to realize this is part of being created in the image of God. He's given us the ability to have self-control. And in this passage, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Isn't it? Don't disregard this. You have the Holy Spirit with yeah, you. Yeah. So. Isn't it interesting that if you go all the way back to the beginning, that this was there. So you've got this perfect yes. world. Man is, you know, sinless. He's put in the garden, but he has to have self-control. There's, there's one tree <laughs> that, uh, and you know, he, we weren't able to do it. We were not able no. to say no to, 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 to deny ourselves and uh, to control our own bodies. And so it is a, a deep, deep principle and a starting point for living a life that pleases God is, is just to not run away from this challenge, uh, to learn to control our own bodies in, in a way that is holy and honorable to him. I was going to say that this, this last paragraph that we were looking at verses nine through 12, where he's talking about love one another and that you're taught by God to do this. Um, 
I think we could spend more time expounding on that, but I actually think that he's going to build on that in chapter five, mm-hmm. how, yes. what he, what he means by loving one another. So we'll talk about that, uh, next week, but do you have any, any final thoughts or takeaways here from chapter four verses one through 12? Yeah, I like the um, walk properly towards God, walk properly towards others. Uh, you highlighted, what was the, your highlight? Um, live a holy life, lead a quiet life. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's completely, totally thematic, exactly the same two principles here. Mm-hmm. Um, walk properly towards God, walk properly towards people. Um, and it, it brings us back to simplifying all of these things and packaging how we live our lives. Love God, love people. Um, and no surprise that Paul is right in step with Jesus, right? I mean, when he talks about the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God, your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbors yourself. No surprise there. Um, but I just, you know, we often have this phrase that it's, it's not complicated, but it's not easy. Um, mm-hmm. and, and this, this passage of scriptures really does highlight that for us. It, it actually is a very simple way of living and not just live, living a quiet life, but also it's very simple. Be kind, be patient. Don't let your, don't, don't let your body be out of control. <laughs> um, take care of other people. I, um, I, I looked up these words about, um, where he talks about leading a quiet life. I, I love that you make it your ambition. You know, this is what you're fighting after. Hmm. Um, I, I just looked that up and it's not, don't be a busy body. Essentially make it your ambition not to be like a busy body. Like you, I, this is my translation. Don't have FOMO. <laughs> like mm. make it your ambition not to have FOMO. Like be satisfied with God. They're, they're, you're not missing out on anything with God. God is not withholding anything good from you. Enjoy him and enjoy the people that God brings in your life. And so it's not complicated. Mm. It is very simple, mm-hmm. but it is not easy. Um, that, that's probably my big takeaway as I finished up uh, this section of First Thess. I really like that. And especially that word on FOMO. I, I think I definitely, that resonates because I think I have some of that. I don't know how much of it is just my personality and how much of it is just the time that we live in where we are constantly chasing, chasing, chasing. And you're right. It is the opposite of having an ambition to lead a quiet life. It kind of goes back to that that first paragraph of learning to control your body. And, so and of good. course... All of us would say, well, yes. Uh, And when it comes to the way that we live and our our sexual practices, we see that God has given us clear instructions throughout scripture. And so we need to control our bodies in that way. But, But like you just highlighted, there are other ways that we are driven by passions outside of just sexual passions or sexual desires that will run uh, contrary to God's pathway for our lives to, to lead these, these quiet lives. Um, so that's, that's a, that's a good word, John. I think my, uh, big takeaway from this chapter was that, you know, making disciples is not just a matter of educating people. So they have the right information about God and the right beliefs about God. So that's, that's a part of making disciples. It's an important part that we, that we help people, learn the truth about God so that they believe the right things about him. But making disciples is really about helping others live in a way that pleases God. And I think we do that by imparting values and a lifestyle, that there are certain values that, you know, the followers of Jesus have. Um, Even like we were just talking about, you know, certain ambitions that we have that are going to look strange to the old version of ourselves or to the world around us who who aren't trying to follow Jesus. So those values need to change. It's not just that I think different thoughts about God, but that my values in life have been changed. And then my lifestyle begins to look different than it did before Jesus. And you see that here with with Paul. Um, His big desire is to give instruction so that these believers, these new believers will continually be changed in their lifestyle so that they're living in a way that, that pleases God. So probably my big takeaway here from, from chapter four. Excellent. We just had Justin Gravitt on the show and he has a phrase that disciple making is ultimately not about knowing something new. It's about becoming something new. Hmm. So, and you can just see this, it's just all over this text where, um, 
this is what this is what we ought to look like. Um, and <laughs> um, work quietly with your hands as we instruct you. And we walk properly hmm. before outsiders, not be dependent upon it. Resemble God, look like God, walk properly um, amongst other peoples because you're walking properly before God. Um, I'm thankful for just the clarity. Um, in fact, a couple times in this book, he actually says, this is God's will for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Um, so there's, those are kind of these clue on clue on moments. Right. And he does that again in this, in this passage. So, um, we've done this every time that we finish these studies. Um, we're barely touching what God showed <laughs> us out of first Thessalonians chapter four, just in the 12 verses. We didn't even look at the whole chapter <laughs> right. by the way, <laughs> you know, um, we will hit that next week, but we can't encourage you enough. We've got some good resources for you. Esort is a great fr free Bible study software that, that we use. Both of us use, and we have a book overview template that both of us have been using for years when we study through a book, how to, and which has questions in just a different format that we use where we, we wrestle through, well, how do we title this chapter? How would we remember this afterwards? A couple books that we've read together, um, Andrew and I have read together, and a couple YouTube links. So we just encourage you to check out those notes. And as always, hop on if you got some questions. Thank, thanks, Christian, for, for just kind of writing some questions and um Please know that both Andrew and I will be praying for you as you seek to become a disciple maker who, do t who DTRs who DTRs well. Um, so, yeah, just want to invite you to jump in the word, um, study the word for yourself. Um, you've got the exact same Holy Spirit as that famous pastor that you like to listen to. That doesn't mean don't use outside resources. Please, you know, be good stewards of the scriptures. But God wants to speak to you just like he's speaking to that man uh, that you listen to on the radio or you see it ch at, ch at church on Sunday. So. Thanks for joining us with this. Andrew, final thoughts from you on First Thess 4. Not, not so much on First Thess 4, but I just want to reinforce what you said, that one of our great challenges and privileges as people who now belong to God, who call him Father, is we get mm -hmm. to learn how to listen and learn directly to God. And um, that's, that's a big part of... Bible study is I'm learning how to listen to God, hear his voice, and then put it into practice, live it out. So I do hope that these, these audios aren't just uh, an encouragement to others about what we're learning, but hopefully a byproduct of that is that you, you'll be inspired to dig deeper into the scriptures uh, for yourself and with fellow believers who you're connected with in your local areas. Like you said, John, we've got links Check out the show notes or the YouTube description. There are links to a lot of tools and resources that we use. So good conversation here on chapter four, John, and we'll wrap up the book next week. Sounds good. Great being with you, Andrew.